Hello, 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 and welcome to the Jolly Heretic. But, but yeah, I, I, what I find amazing, again and again and again, though, Charlie, when I watch your videos, is the number of people that say you can't film me without my consent. Where has this idea come from? Where, oh, where has this idea come from that you can't film people in a public place without their consent? You I know, do not I usually write it off as stupidity. People thinking in their bovine, like, everyday normie brains, like, oh, oh, you're not allowed to just, like, you know, it's, it's rude. You should ask permission. Like, you can't just film me. But I actually think the people that kick off are maybe a bit smarter than I give them credit for, and they're abstracting the fact that they're not comfortable with how they look and how they act, and they're pissed off, and society has turned them into a sociopath. They've become bitter and twisted and angry and gnarled and hateful, which is probably why I'm filming them, because they're shoplifting or beating someone up or getting thrown in the back of a police van. So of course, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to like it. But I think it's it's shame. Shame, good old-fashioned shame means that they don't want to be filmed. But people need to work on themselves. And not only work on themselves, Ed, but get over themselves. You're not that important. You can't ask random people not to point a small piece of glass and metal at you. Just because it's got a lens on it, it's not your business. Like, yeah, look, I don't go up to people and put the camera right in their face with that. They worry I might break their nose by smashing the camera into them. It's always two meters away. You know, I, you know I'm a big guy. I don't want to intimidate people and, you know, get myself in trouble for it. Auditors defend their activities by shifting the goalposts. They say photography is not a crime. This is a trick. Everybody already knows that photography is not a crime. That is not the real objection to auditors. It's not the photography bit that's a problem. Auditing does not merely involve passively testing how people respond to photography. What auditors are doing, in reality, is using photography to abuse people by setting up situations in which they know that ordinary people will very likely react negatively. Obviously, some professional photographers, such as tabloid photographers, also use their trade to abuse others in a similar way, but that will be at least in pursuit of a news story or other matter of public interest, and those photographers are still subject to newspaper complaint systems and the general law. They are accountable for what they do. They can't just say that photography is not a crime. Auditors don't behave like photographers. They see rights in a vacuum and don't accept they are accountable too. They don't comply with their data protection obligations. They trespass on business premises without reason and turn up in other places where photographers are not usually expected to be. This is not to say that industrial photography is wrong. It's a perfectly legal activity where it is photography. But these are the type of places where a photographer may expect to encounter people going about their business and to be approached and ask, asked what he's doing. Let me repeat, that doesn't mean there is anything wrong with photographing ordinary people going about their business at work and in the street, even without their consent. It is perfectly legal to photograph people in public, even without their consent, as well as photographing buildings and other things without the consent of the owners or occupiers. There's a whole field of photography that covers street photography, industrial photography and photographing sensitive buildings. These are legitimate activities and there are millions of YouTube channels for this very purpose and nobody bats an eyelid. Why do auditors have all these problems when they go out and photograph things? Well, some of the more legitimate YouTubers will encounter objections and problems too, but it won't happen very often and it can be dealt with in an amicable way. When challenged, those photographers and YouTubers will simply explain what they're doing, or move on, or both. They don't, in general, turn it into a massive drama or a civil liberties issue. They don't start calling people sausages and muppets. That's because it's intuitively understood that rights are a bargain between me, you and others. 
If I stood outside your place of work, constantly filming you and your colleagues going in and out, with the threat that I'm going to put you on YouTube, there will come a point when I will, rightly, be asked to move on, and if I refuse, the police may have to become involved and I may be accused of harassment or a public order offence, because you have rights as well. My rights don't exist in a vacuum. For most of us, all this is mere common sense, and most people don't even have to think about it too much as such, because it's obvious and intuitive that our rights are subject to the rights of others, and come with responsibilities to others. Otherwise, society would descend into chaos, with everybody just doing as they please. It would be nice to think that we can all do as we please. I'd certainly like to do as I please. But as adults, we know that we can't entirely do so. Auditors don't seem able to accommodate this in their heads. The sociological and legal comprehension of the average auditor belongs in a noddy book. It's not the adult reality. That brings me back to Charles Veach. He's read the legislation. There's something about public, sorry, private land but has public access. Charles Veach has a brain in his head and should know better than that. Here he defends himself by saying this. You're not that important. You can't ask random people not to point a small piece of glass and metal at you just because it's got a lens on it. It's not your business. Like, yeah, look, I don't go up to people and put the camera right in their face with that. They worry I might break their nose by smashing the camera into them. It's always two meters away. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a big guy. I don't want to intimidate people and you know get myself in trouble for it. If you take what he says there at face value, there's a charming naivety and guilelessness about this man, but underneath it, I think he knows what he's doing is wrong. But his arguments are difficult to counter because, obviously, despite his naivety, he does have some intellect and, he, and he's public school educated and quite well spoken, so what he's giving us is the glossy brochure defence that reflects how auditors would ideally want to see themselves. He's like the smooth travel agent who wants to persuade you to go on that bargain excursion to North Sentinel Island. It's that bit more sophisticated than just shouting Pinnock, which is easy to shoot down. But Charles Veach's defence relies on the same trick as Pinnock, which is to shift the goalposts, but the way he frames the debate is that bit more sophisticated than the other auditors. On the surface, Charles Veach isn't an auditor at all, for the most part. He does take part in auditing sometimes, I've covered at least one of his auditing excursions, and he also supports other auditors, but his content is more journalistic, more about social commentary, and takes him and takes place in busy and crowded streets where people are more anonymous, rather than at public buildings and business premises where people are more identifiable. However, this difference is only on the surface. While some of his content could be regarded as legitimate citizen journalism or documentary making, most of it is just Charles Veach inserting himself into situations in order to cause annoyance for the purpose of provoking a response that he can then film for views. Basically, for all his intelligence, his methods are very crude. A journalist or documentary maker does not make himself a story. Charles Veach complains that people are interfering with his right to film in public, but there are millions of channels on YouTube that record much the same things that Charles Veach does, but they do it in a sympathetic way that respects the dignity of the subject. None of those people seem to encounter complaints about them filming in public, or if they do, it doesn't seem to feature much on their channels. I could name dozens of such channels off the top of my head. Wendell, Billy Moore, Honest Places. One thing that distinguishes those from Charles Veach is that they don't make it about themselves. It's about the people and places they record. They don't record drama just for the sake of it. They don't insert themselves into people's lives to create drama or worsen their problems. I think it's pretty certain that all of these more legitimate YouTubers I mention have met with objections to filming, but you don't see them calling people a silly sausage or a muppet like Marty Bladborough and Auditing Yorkshire do. They don't whinge about it like Charles Veach making out he's some sort of hero. They just get on with it. You don't see them getting into fights with anybody or doing a kung fu kick on some homeless person. It's about the content, not about them. There are millions of channels like these that get along fine. None of them are complaining about not having a right to film in public. The truth is that auditing is an astroturf trend, and in common with other auditors, Charles Veach is engineering the content he films. His content is a form of social engineering in itself. 
A journalist would simply record and report on what he sees, not try to create the events he records. Veach's content is fake and false in that sense. There is a journalistic movement I want to mention at this point called Gonzo Journalism, which was pioneered in the 1960s by the American Hunter S. Thompson. What, what is Gonzo Journalism and why do you call it that? That word has really played me because uh, first I realized I was doing something different it's at some point really for Scanlon's magazine rather than Rolling Stone, even before Rolling Stone. But it, uh, I wasn't really in this country when the new, you know, new journalism sort of began. And I wasn't sure I was doing that. But I was sure I wasn't doing, you know, uh, what we call straight journalism. Right. And after I'd uh, done a story in the Kentucky Derby for Scanlon's, a friend of mine who had covered the New York, I mean, the New Hampshire primary with me in 68, who's from Boston, and I'd recall him, I'd recall him using this word gonzo in a sort of uh, indefinable kind of way as kind of nice, crazy, like, you know, zing, gonzo. He wrote me a, a note saying uh, that derby piece with pure gonzo. A more contemporary example of broadly the same thing would be someone like Louis Ferru. But gonzo journalism is not actually journalism. Its whole point is that it lacks objectivity. Journalism is an objective pursuit. And even if we could consider my argument as grounded in an appeal to purity fallacy, the no true Scotsman fallacy, and I'm wrong about this and gonzo journalism could be considered journalism after all, that does not mean provoking and abusing other people for views is something that Hunter S. Thompson or Louis Ferru would condone. Nor should we condone it, and we would not condone it if a real journalist did it. For one thing, we should not approve of it because it presents us with a false picture. It's a great irony that Charles Veach and people like him bang on about media manipulation and fake news, often rightly so, when they are creating fake news themselves, just as other auditors create fake news by spinning their confrontations with innocent working people as just a form of journalism, when in reality they provoke the confrontations in the first place. I think at some point Charles Veach will want to distance himself from the other auditors, actually. That's why I've uploaded to my channel some clips of him associating with or praising auditors. I want to make sure that he stays on the record as a friend of auditors. Charles Veach wants us to think that all he's doing is just photographing his subjects, recording what they're doing, in the way that any photographic journalist or social commenter would do. That's how he wants to frame it so that the debate takes place on ground that is favourable to him, and he gets to enjoy an aura of respectability. The name for this rhetorical technique is whitewashing. In reality, he's just shifting the debate onto more favourable territory, whitewashing the issues. The issue with him and the less sophisticated auditors isn't that they have a right to photograph in public. Let me repeat, we already know that right exists. It's that Charles Veach and auditors extend that right into abusing other people, including other people's rights. Admittedly, there are moral and legal grey areas, especially concerning the work of Charles Veach himself, because he's cleverer than the others. He sticks to busy and crowded areas where it's unlikely a reasonable expectation of privacy would arise. But even in that sort of content, it's clear that at times he uses the camera as a provocative device to annoy people on purpose. A journalist in the true sense uses the camera as a tool for the purpose of recording the scene. But there's more to say. Ironically, Charles Veach has more in common with today's mainstream media than he may care to admit. Like them, he blurs the line between objectivity and subjectivity. Major mainstream media also use this style of journalism, sneakily editorialising coverage of major events and assigning political significance to them. Some journalists have successfully blurred the line between reporter and activist, becoming characters in the story they're covering. That is what Charles Veach does. He's no better. Veach also takes advantage of the fact that most of the people he encounters are just ordinary folk who won't have a good understanding of the detailed nuances of photography law. In common with other auditors, he thinks that by correcting them on his general rights, so far as he understands them at all, he has won the battle. He refuses to recognise that, even if he is strictly within the law in a specific situation, there is such a thing as manners and common decency towards others that he should have a justification to override. 
He will say that this doesn't matter, he can do as he likes, but would he like the same thing to be done to him? All the evidence suggests not. These people that he mocks and looks down on have a natural aversion to being filmed by some creepy man pointing a camera at them, and they sense that he looks down on them, and they are usually people who can't answer back in an articulate way, and can't appeal to the authorities for help in the same way that an articulate person, such as Charles Veach, can. Indeed, much to the shame of Greater Manchester Police, Charles Veach seems to have inveigled himself with officers. To put it crudely, in my opinion, he's a naive posh boy who finds entertainment and amusement in the suffering of society's down and outs. Some may find it entertaining to watch, but they should reflect that it's the royal road to more legal restrictions on public photography, and ultimately less liberty for all of us. Although I say Charles Veach is intelligent, he sees everything through himself and wants to be the centre of everything. He doesn't understand that if you abuse your rights and take liberties with people, eventually there's going to be a backlash. And maybe that backlash won't just be against Charles Veach, it may be against all of us.